Well, good morning. Happy Tuesday. It is Tuesday, uh, October 2024. Um, I have no idea what, what the temperature is outside. It fluctuates quite a bit. Um, it says right now 70. Um, I wore a long sleeve shirt this morning out of my walk because it's been cold. And, I, and um, so that's why I'm wearing long sleeve shirt. Um, thank you for joining me. I hope you're having a great day so far. Um, <laughs> well, I hope you are because the day has just started. Um, and uh, what a beautiful, you know, this is such a great time of year. It really, really is. Um, th this time leading up to to where it starts getting really, really cold. The, the mornings are crisp and fresh and beautiful, and it's just wonderful. And I hope you get outside and enjoy the, enjoy the day. This is this is why we live in this in this area. I think about so there apparently I found out recently that the Hohokam Indians actually came all the way down into Tucson and on the north uh, west portion of Tucson uh, up uh, in some mountain range up in there there's some Hohokam Indian ruins. And I didn't. I'm, I grew up in Phoenix, and I knew they were in Phoenix, but I didn't know that they were in, in Tucson. And uh, I may have mentioned this before, but um, there must have there was some catastrophic event that prevented the Hohokams from living here, and uh, so they had to leave. But what what could that a catastrophic event be? Well, it could be heat, right? An ex an extensive heat wave that was killing all the plants or lack of water. Maybe the water kind of started to evaporate and the, and the, uh, the stream beds dried up for a period of time. And, um, you know, obviously if you have no water, you have to dig the well deeper. Well, if you can't go, I mean, you can only dig a well so, so deep before you just can't dig it any, anymore. But today with modern technology, we can get water out of the ground and we can have air conditioning or swamp comp, swamp coolers, I mean, we can actually survive in Arizona pretty well. And it's a lot easier to survive here than it is in places where it gets freezing, freezing, freezing cold or hurricanes. <laughs> um, there's a hurricane, Milton, that's on its way to go to Tampa, Florida. And um, I guess the storm surge may be 12 feet. The one, the Helene hurricane that just hit was 8 feet. So this is a 50% higher storm surge than, than Helene, which just was devastating. So we need to keep the people of Milton in our prayers or, or in the path of Milton in our prayers because this, this could be a very, very nasty and potentially deadly hurricane. I'm hoping that people are, um, you know, getting out of the storm surge, trying to figure out ways that they can stay safe because it, it, could, be, it could be devastating. Um, obviously, don't want to leave your home. That that would not be fun, and particularly because of vandalism in your home, um, or potentially there could be, uh, uh, you know, I, no place to stay. If you leave and you go out of the storm surge, are you going to be able to find relatives to live with or a hotel to stay in or something like that? And all those are big questions. When I hit, uh, my brother-in-law was living in Houston. So was my my in-laws. Um, fortunately, neither of them their their homes were damaged. But I was just worried sick about it. Because um, what if uh, you know? What if you don't hear from them? What do you do? <laughs> it's one of those scary things. All right, um, we do have a birthday today, and the birthday is Mike Levine. Happy birthday, Mike! Hope you have a great day. I wonder if this is a no. It's probably not a big one. Um, uh, all right. Uh, what other things do I want to say? I think that's about it. Um, yeah, let, let's get into our study. We are in Second Kings chapter 14, and there's this king of Judah, and his name is Amaziah. And he fought the Edomites, and apparently he was very, very successful at fighting the Edomites. So feeling full of himself, he decides he wants to attack Israel to the north. Now, remember, Israel and Judah are kind of the same nation. Like, why would they attack them? But as we've seen, after King David and after King Solomon, the, uh, the nation of Israel divided into two. 
Judah to the south, Israel to the north. And um, let's drop something. Uh, Israel to the north, Judah to the south. And they've kind of turned into two different places. And even though they have the common heritage of people of God, they are not they're not walking together as people of God. And if you're not walking together, uh, united by something, you're going to go to war against each other. What binds us together here in the United States is the Constitution. So if we all pledge allegiance to the Constitution, then we should be right all, all on the same page. Well, they didn't have a Constitution back then. All they had was the Law of Moses. And um, even though even though the whole entire nation of Israel and the nation of Judah all were followers of the law of Moses, they didn't necessarily do that. They allowed other gods to come in. They became what they call a pluralist society, P-L-U-R-A-I-S-T, pluralist, <laughs> P-L-U-R-A-L-I-S-T, pluralist society, which means that... Um, you, you know, uh, they're no longer completely united by God. They're they're united. They have different gods coming in, and and so you get different. Um, I, I don't want to call it politics, but you but you get different ways of achieving power, um, and it, it's just dividing Israel and Judah to the point where Judah now wants to go to war with Israel. And when you think about it, you think that's crazy. I mean, that would be like. Arizona going to war with California or Texas going to war against Florida or something like that. I mean, it happens throughout history, but there's no reason for it to happen. And if, if everybody was united around God's word, uh, uh, around the law of Moses, then it wouldn't happen. But it takes strong leadership to do that. And um, you can't blame the king that's king now. He inherited a mess. And he's trying to keep things together as possible. But Amaziah does seem to feel, it seems to me as if Amaziah is just poking the bear. And, um, you know, you probably shouldn't poke the bear. So he, he notifies the king that he wants to meet on the battlefield. And the king's like, you don't want to do this. This is dumb. <laughs> this is foolish. And so uh, he says, don't do it. And so the question we have now before us is, will Amaziah fight? Will he continue to poke the bear or will he leave well enough alone? And uh, so that's where we pick up the story in chapter 14, verse 11. So we'll begin reading. Amaziah, however, would not listen. So Jehoash, king of Israel, attacked. He and Amaziah, king of Judah, faced each other at Bel Shemesh in Judah. Judah was routed by Israel, and every man fled to his home. Jehoash, king of Israel, captured Amaziah, king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Ahaziah, at Beth Shemesh. Then Joash went to Jerusalem and broke down the wall of Jerusalem from the Ephraim gate to the corner gate, a section about 400 cubits long. He took all the gold and silver and all the articles found in the temple of the Lord and in the treasuries of the royal palace he also took hostages, and he returned to Samaria. All right. So um, <laughs> he poked the bear, and it didn't go well for him. <sighs> so if you're going to fight a battle, you really need to count what the cost is and look at your enemy. Because th this is... It's not the worst case scenario, but it's pretty close to the worst case scenario. The worst case scenario is that they kill everybody. You know, that uh, they would come in, destroy everything, kill all the people, and then it's never a threat again. And if you look in Israel's past, we've seen this, that Israel did just that to some of their enemies. They went in, they completely annihilated and destroyed the city, they killed all the people, they left everything, and then they left, and then it's no longer a threat. And really, that's about the only way that you can make sure that it's not a threat. Because if you leave any survivors, or if you leave a place for people to congregate, like a, a you know village, then people eventually start to occupy that village again, and then it becomes a threat. Um, 
for whatever reason, Joash, Jehoash, decides only to capture the king and to leave the people. And um, that, that is, uh, you know, he's making a calculated risk because the people could say, you have our king and we want our king back, so we're going to continue to fight you. Or they might say, well, he was a pretty good king, <laughs> but you can have him. We'll find somebody else that's not going to attack you. <laughs> but, but, the, but the worst thing is, is that he plummets. He plunders the, uh, the gold and silver from the temple and the gold and silver from the, from the royal palace and um, takes it all. So he takes all the valuable jewelries, the wealth and the king. And um, the, the, it's not the worst case scenario, but it's pretty bad. So how are they going to survive? As for the other events of the reign of Jehoash, what he did in his achievements, including his war against Amaziah, king of Judah, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel? Jehoash rested with his ancestors and was buried in Samaria with the kings of Israel, and Jeroboam, his son, succeeded him as king. Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, lived for 15 years after the deaths of Jehoash, son of Jehoahaz, king of Israel. As for the other events of Amaziah's reign, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? They conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lashish, but they sent men after him to Lashish and killed him there. So this is uh, Amaziah. They conspired against him in Jerusalem, and he fled to Lashish, but they sent men after him in Lashish, and they killed him. He was brought back by horse and buried in Jerusalem with his ancestors in the city of David. Then all the people of Judah took Azariah, who was 16 years old, and made him king in place of his father Amaziah. He was the one who rebuilt Elath and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. So um, when he went to Samaria, um, it appears that, uh, you know, we could go into Chronicles and read the story. I'm trying not to do that. I'm trying to get the perspective of just here. But um, apparently he lived and he tried to flee to go back to Jerusalem while he was living. And um, he was killed um, when, he, uh, when he tried to flee. He went to Lashish, and, and that's where he was killed. But, but they were nice enough to bring him back by horse to have him buried with his ancestors. And then his son becomes king. And the son is 16 years old. And his name is Azariah. So you go from Amaziah to Azariah. And remember, when it ends in A-H, uh, that is a very, very Jewish name because it, it's, uh, it's something of Yahweh. And A-H is short for Yahweh at the end of a name. So you have Obadiah, Nehemiah, Jeremiah. Anything that ends with A-H is a, is a Jewish name. Um. And this son rebuilt Eloth and restored it to Judah after Amaziah rested with his ancestors. So these kings don't last very long. He started out as a good king, but he did not end up in a good, as a good king. We, if we look at our table of kings, if I can pull that up. Oh, isn't that convenient? Um, I pull up the table of kings, Amaziah. Um, uh, started out good, ended up evil, and um, he overlapped with Jehoash and Jeroboam, and um, his son Azariah becomes king. Now, notice this uh, in the table. Azariah is really Uzziah, and you may have heard the name Uzziah before. Doesn't it say? Yeah, Isaiah right here. Um, the prophet Isaiah. The wonderful book of Isaiah, this large prophecy by Isaiah that speaks so much of Jesus. Well, that prophecy happened during the reign of Uzziah. Remember when Uzziah was king and sitting on the throne, uh, here am I, send me, send me, said Isaiah. Um, th this, is, this is the time now that Isaiah is about to come into prophecy. 
And so this gives a little flavor and a context to what is happening in Judah and Israel at the time of Isaiah. All right. Um, let's see. Let's just continue reading. Verse 23. In the 15th year of Amaziah, son of Joash, king of Judah, Jeroboam, son of Jehoash, king of Israel, became king of Samaria, and he reigned 41 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord and did not turn away from any of the sins of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, which he had caused Israel to commit. He was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord. The God of Israel spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer, spoken through his servant Jonah. Now, have you heard of Jonah before? <laughs> Jonah was also a prophet. And God told him to go prophet, to prophesy in Nineveh, remember? And he says, I don't want to prophesy in Nineveh. And so what happens to Jonah? He gets eaten by a big fish. Um, that's the Jonah here. So this gives flavor and context to some of these prophets that exist. Uh, I don't think Jonah is mentioned very much in the Old Testament outside of the, his prophecy and what happened to him. Um, but here he's mentioned really quickly through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from Gath Hefer. So this is Jeroboam, king of Israel. 26, the Lord had seen how bitterly everyone in Israel, whether slave or free, was suffering. There was no one to help them. And since the Lord had not said he will blot out the name of Israel from under heaven, he saved them by the hand of Jeroboam, son of Jehoash. As for the other events of Jeroboam's reign, all he did and his military achievements, including how he recovered for Israel both Damascus and Hamath, which had belonged to Judah, are they not written in the books or in the book of the annals of the kings of Israel. Jeroboam rested with his ancestors, the king of Israel, and Zechariah, his son, succeeded him as king. So um, we're not getting a whole lot of stuff here, except that we're finding out that um, there's a lot of war. None of the kings are following God, so things aren't going well. I have this theory and I may have mentioned it before. The older I get, I forget who I mentioned theories to. <laughs> so I apologize if I've said this before. But when we talk about the law of Moses and how everybody should follow the law of Moses, that that should be the gold standard that guides a society. We think that if we follow the law of Moses, God will be pleased and then God will intervene in wars and things like that uh, to, to make the nation prosper. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, right? So if you follow God, God will intervene and he will make your nation prosper. But as we have seen throughout the history of Israel, it hasn't happened very well. And a lot of war, a lot of famine, a lot of suffering of the people because ostensibly God is not pleased. But here's my theory, and it, it overlaps with that theory, but the overlapping of the theory is this, that if people simply follow God and his law, they interact with each other better. The natural human condition is to game the system, to, to get close to power so that power will give you more power, more wealth, to lie, to bear false witness, to cheat, to steal. If you'll remember, God's law is not, it's not huge. It's basically, basically, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, have one God. You know, there's the first table of the law, the first three or four laws that talk about how you should relate to God. And then the, just seven really commandments on how to relate to each other. It's don't lie, it's don't cheat, don't steal, don't bear false witness, honor your father and mother, don't commit adultery, don't kill, um, and don't covet your neighbor's stuff. I mean, basically, it, it's, not, it's not like a big thing to follow God's law. It's not huge. But if a nation follows these words, th then they are 
they live together well. Let me put it that way. They live together well. And of course, they're not going to follow it because nobody can. Nobody's perfect. All have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Um, so there has to be a punishment. There has to be a retribution. But there has to be a way that people can live after the punishment retribution. Um, and this really is the heart of the Christian faith, that we've been redeemed by God. We, we strive to follow him, but we fail because all have fallen short of the glory of God. And um, his punishment um, is upon us, but we, 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 we confess those sins to God and he forgives us and we move on with our life. I mean, that's a healthy way to have a society. But you got to have a gold standard. You got to have something that binds the society together that this says, if we're going to live together as a society, these are the rules by which we should live together. And if we do this, our society will be blessed. Because instead of a secretive, um, you know, I'm going to get you and you're going to try to get me and all these different things, we're all going to try to get along well. Um, but, but Israel just hasn't, Israel can't do it. And what nation has? I guess probably the closest has been, uh, you know, European nations, even the United States um, has really, really tried to... Uh, to if you look at the, not the Constitution of the United States, but the laws of the United States, they're really, really based in um, God's law, the Ten Commandments. I mean, if you look at how we live as a nation, they all are based on the Ten Commandments, <laughs> or at least the Seven Commandments, the second half of the law, how we relate to each other. Um, and, and the United States has done well. And, um, of course, they've tried to, they, there are many people that uh, don't, like that as an ideal, but it really is a good ideal. And when we follow it, we do well. Uh, it truly is blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, because we all understand what the standard is, the gold standard on how to relate to each other, and we live by it. So anyway, it's not hard. It really, truly isn't hard. <laughs> I, uh, I'm thinking about doing another sermon series on the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, and the, the problem is there's so much, I mean, I could go a year on the Ten Commandments because of all the things circulating in Scripture that I think about. But um, it truly is a, a blessed way to live as a society. If, you, if you're not living as a society, you're living as a family, you know, nomadic tribal family. It's, it's, uh, it's different. You know, we all love each other. We fight for each other. We care for each other. But as a society gets larger, more complex, you have to put in some laws in place to how we're going to relate to each other. When you're tribal, the head of the tribe, the oldest male member of the tribe, makes all the rules, makes all the decisions, how to keep the tribe together. Once you get beyond that, once you be, get beyond the family unit, then, then uh, you have to put in some other rules into place. Don't kill, don't bear false witness, and don't lie, steal, and cheat. I mean, don't lie, steal, and cheat. Those are basically the ways that a society can live together. Okay, um, and uh, we will get into the next king of Judah when we, uh, when we get into this and next time. So uh, let's close in prayer. Gracious God, thanks for this day, and uh, we pray for those who are in the path of the hurricane. We pray that you'd be with them as they prepare and be with them when the hurricane hits. Um, thank you for this time, and until we meet again, keep us in your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, let's go over here. Um, they're still trying to dig out of the last hurricane. Yeah, it's it's uh, very scary. Can you imagine? One hurricane right after the other. This is why I would really not want to live in the path of hurricane or in live in Tornado Alley. Um, I'll deal with snakes any day, <laughs> which is about the only thing we have here to worry about. Um, and snakes don't bother me. I actually like them. So, I mean, I don't like them, but I know, I know how to live with them. Let me put it that way. 
All right. So, uh, hey, thanks for joining me, and I hope you have a great day. And um, we will see you later. Take care. Bye.